Good morning. Politicians of every persuasion have to face up to the crisis in our energy supply. This morning, we're in the capital of the UK's oil and gas industry, Aberdeen, for the SNP conference. I'll be talking live to Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Her mission, to make Scotland an independent country. Her hope, a referendum next year. I can announce that the Scottish Government is proposing that the independence referendum be held on the 19th of October 2023. In days, a court will consider if a vote can be held. Nicola Sturgeon's had extraordinary success, but not everyone's on board. Yet the most pressing problem everywhere affects every one of us. Warnings of blackouts to UK ministers. We do have good energy supplies in the UK. We can get through the winter. Struggling to keep control after spooking the markets. I get it and I, and I, Are changed, you sorry? I changed the policy. Are of, you course, sorry? of course I'm sorry. And plenty of the public. The question that confronts us wherever you are this morning. How to be sure this doesn't happen. This morning, we're joined live in the Aberdeen Art Gallery by Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. From Oxford, by the one-time Liz Truss superfan and former Culture Secretary, Nadine Dorries. From London, by the Prime Minister's fixer, the Cabinet Office Minister, Nadine Zahawi. And with us here in Aberdeen is a man known by millions as DI Jimmy Perez. Douglas Henschel is here to talk about why he walked away from Shetland and what's next for him. And with us to reflect on the interviews and our conversations and what's making the news is the former Labour Chancellor Alistair Darling, the SNP MP Joanna Cherry, a radical, not a rebel, she says, who was sacked from the front bench, and the Chief Operating Officer of the energy company SSE, Martin Pibworth. A very, very warm welcome to you all from Aberdeen. We're in this beautiful gallery and the SNP is gathering just up the road at their annual conference. We are in the city centre with tons to talk about. And of course, Alistair Darling, what's on so many people's mind is what's been going on in the economy. With all of your experience of having been the Chancellor in charge during the last crisis, how would you describe the situation we're in now? Well, it's chaotic. And, uh, you know, it's, they're giving a textbook example of everything you shouldn't do uh, in, in difficult times. The problem they've got is that at a very febrile time, we've got high inflation, the strengthening dollar, uh, they suddenly decided that they were going to have £45 billion pounds of unfunded uh, tax cuts. Politically, it was a disaster because they wanted to reduce the top rates of tax, for, fr frankly, for people who don't actually need it. And the real problem is people are, are losing credibility in this government's ability to govern. They don't have any confidence in what they're doing. And when you fall out, you know, there's clearly a diff, diff, they didn't tell the Bank of England what they were doing, and the Bank of England suddenly, having announced that it wasn't going to uh, continue with its quantitative easing, then had to go back into the market. And the real problem is all this feeds back into higher interest rates and to mortgage payers who are suddenly being faced with very, very high mortgage bills they simply weren't expecting. But there are similar pressures in lots of other countries, though, aren't they? I mean, the government's having yeah. to contend with that too in other parts of the world. Yes, you're right that other governments are having to deal with this. Other governments have got high levels of debt. Why is it, though, mm. that our, the pound tanked after this announcement. It was this announcement, it was self-inflicted, it wouldn't have happened if they hadn't done it. Mm. But they, they wanted to do it for political reasons, they didn't prepare the ground, they didn't talk to the people they should have uh, talked to. The result is, at one point, we were, it, it was costing this country more to borrow money than it does Italy or Greece, for example. This is, it, it, it is really trashing our reputation, as well as, of course, millions of people are going to pay the price and, for this. And we'll put some of that to the Conservative Minister Nadine Zahawi later, Zahawi later on. Um, Martin Pibworth, in terms of the pressures this winter, what's happening in the energy market is such a big part of it. Why specifically this year is there such a crunch? 
Yeah, so um, National Grid issued a report um, earlier this week where they talked about energy balances going forward. It's their responsibility to look after the markets. And actually, that report um, had some comfort in it in terms of um, the investments uh, the UK has made historically in renewables gives us a little bit more um, security supply compared to maybe some of our European neighbours. And there are various issues going on in the energy markets right now. Of course, the weaponisation of gas supplies by, by, by the Putin regime um, is clearly quite a big issue mm. in terms of the volatility that's being caused. But on top of that, there's other things happening as well. So French nuclear um, um, generation has been down on its normal um, expectation, and that affects us because traditionally the French export to, to us during, during the winter months. On top of that, there's been other issues going on across the summer. Drought um, in Scandinavia and across Europe has affected not only hydro levels, but also has affected the ability of things like coal barges to go up the Rhine to stock And German that all feeds stations. through to the kind of and pressures that we're having there. And all feeds through creates a little bit more risk. What protects the UK a bit more is its renewable investments mm. that's made historically. And actually, this is a great opportunity to think about how we can increase those investments to get better energy security going and forward. And there's certainly a lot of pressure to do that now. Let's just take a quick look at the front pages here in Scotland. And lots of focus on what's happening at the SNP conference. You can see there, I hope, Scotland on Sunday, the Herald and the National um, having a conference special. The UK front pages then, and we'll be talking about this later. Cabinet ministers calling for unity. We'll see if the Conservatives have got much chance of that in the next few days. Um, but Joanna Cherry, obviously, you're watching very keenly what's happening at the SNP conference this week. In advance of it, you suggested that the party could no longer just keep saying, up with this, we will not put. So what would you like to hear instead? Well, in fairness, the party is no longer saying that. And we're, we're meeting at a very exciting time for the SNP. It's the first time we've met in person for three years. First time since our third general election victory in, our, in a row. First time since our fourth Scottish election victory in a row. Uh, independence is riding high in the opinion polls. Social Attitude Survey shows support at uh, 52%. Uh, the tanking of the British economy by the Tories has destroyed the argument which Alistair ran in the last referendum about the broad shoulders of the UK and Scotland being better off in the UK than out with it. And the energy crisis shows the failures of the British government to invest in the incredible renewable so resources we have in Scotland. So what do you want to hear from the First Minister this morning? Because you have, from time to time, been keener to hear more urgency, haven't you? Well, the First Minister has announced a plan which I suggested several years ago, which is to test the legality of uh, whether or not the Scottish Parliament uh, can hold an, an independence referendum in the Supreme Court next week, and I'm very much looking forward to going to court and hearing uh, the arguments. And I've, I've enjoyed reading the written arguments both on behalf of the Lord Advocate and behalf of the Scottish National Party, which stress uh, the right of self-determination mm -hmm in international law. So the First Minister has announced that, and I'm completely in agreement with her that until such times mm -hmm. as we see what the judgment of the Supreme Court is, uh, there's no need to flesh out the, the later start, the later parts of her strategy. We need to wait and see what the Supreme Court says. But okay. you see, really, we need to well, take this back well, to basics, because this isn't really an issue of law. This is an issue of politics and constitutionality. Okay. There's a majority in the Scottish mm -hmm. Parliament in favour of a second independence referendum. The last time that happened, the British government came to the negotiating table and agreed that there could be a referendum. That is the custom and practice of the British well, Constitution. Well, let's see what the First Minister's got to say. You guys are with us throughout the programme, so we'll be back to you a little <coughs> later on. Now, Nicola Sturgeon is probably the most successful politician of her generation. Certainly the last one standing after several Prime Ministers <laughs> have come and gone during her time in office. But that dream of an independent Scotland still eludes her. Could the country reach another junction soon? Well, here she is. First Minister, <laughs> good standing. morning. Not perhaps the best <laughs> intro I've ever had, Laura. Well, let, 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 let's, let's see then. You are, you are here. We're glad that you're here this morning. You have promised to the country, and under your plan, Scotland is due to have a referendum in a year and ten days' mm -hmm. time. Are you confident that will happen? Uh, yes, I am confident that uh, that can happen. Um, as Joanna Cherry's just been outlining, the Supreme Court next week will consider the question of does the Scottish Parliament have the competence to legislate for that referendum? There's little point speculating on the outcome mm -hmm. of a, a court uh, hearing. But should the answer to that be yes, we have the plans ready to go to legislate. Uh, the at work on refreshing and updating the substantive case for independence mm -hmm. is well underway. In fact, that will continue over the course of mm -hmm. the next days. Um, so, you know, let's, as Joanna just said, 
wait and see what the court says. And, but, you, and it, confident Scotland is going to become independent. But if you have that vote, what's to stop the UK government saying, well, we're not going to take part, we're not going to participate? Look, I, I cannot sit here and... Uh, predicate everything I do on uh, the, the basis that a UK government will continue to act in a deeply anti-democratic fashion. I've got to do what I consider to be the right thing, which is firstly respecting the will of the Scottish people, which remember is for an independence referendum. I was elected last year as First Minister on a record share of the vote, on a record turnout, on a very clear manifesto commitment to a referendum. But just so, on that practical point, and I know why you want to have it and you believe you've got the right to have well, that, but think, on that practical point, mm -hmm. you can't stop the UK saying, we're not taking I part. I don't think, if, if the Supreme Court paves the way for a lawful referendum next year, I, I think the vast majority of the people of Scotland would take part in that. Mm. And, you know, the UK government might decide to say they don't want them to take part in that, mm. but I don't think that is going to prevail. And I, but, apart from anything else, I think the overwhelming impression that that gives, which I think the UK government is already giving by their refusal to countenance democracy, is that they don't believe they can win the substantive case. If, if you are confident in your arguments in politics, if you are confident in the case that you are making, then you don't fear democracy. Mm. You actually relish the opportunity to put your case before the people and let the people decide. Well, let's talk about where the arguments are then, and I think we can show you and also the audience where support for independence has mm. been. So if we look there, this graph goes all the way back to July 2016, and essentially it's 50-50. It's been 50-50 mm. for a long time, bouncing up and down a bit. But there's another question that people are asked about whether or not they want the choice now or would they like the choice in a few years. And if we can look at that then, it paints really quite a different picture. And I think if we can bring this up, essentially support for having a referendum now is far, far lower. Look at this here. When do you want another Scottish referendum? Again, people have been asked over time. In the next 12 months, that's often less than 30%. So do you really feel that the public want to have this now, no. let, let because make, the polls suggest something very different. Let me make two points in, in response to that. It's a fair question. Firstly, you know, opinion polls are important. You know, no politician who says opinion polls are not important is, is credible because we all love poring over opinion polls. But mm. on this question of is there a mandate for an independence referendum, we don't actually have to look at opinion polls because mm. that election result that I talked about last year, yeah. The SNP won the election on a very clear manifesto commitment. Now, usually political parties get criticised for not sticking to and delivering their manifesto commitments. I'm getting criticised in this context for trying to deliver on that commitment. But secondly, and this is the substantive point, you know, we are seeing every day right now the issues you were speaking to the panel about, the consequences mm. for Scotland of not being independent. You know, Alistair uh, in 2014 told the people of Scotland uh, with his colleagues that independence would threaten our membership of the European Union, independence would imperil people's pensions, independence would cause a currency crisis. Look where we are right now, out of the, the European Union, pensions within hours but uh, first of minister, falling the, but the down arguments and for and against. the currency plunging. These are the consequences that people are paying the price of right now. But and for, these all flow for Scotland but, from not being an independent but, country. And, and that's your view and you've made that very clear. But the question of the arguments for and against independence is a different one to whether there really is public clamour, public demand for a vote within the next year in 12 months, which is what, which is what you would like. And, and what, we've, what we've shown people this morning is there isn't a huge clamour to have a vote and the arguments are pretty settled 50-50. Look, I fought an election on this manifesto commitment and won the election overwhelmingly. You know, I, I believe that there is an appetite for a referendum. The opinion mm -hmm. polls on this question, even more than opinion polls on the headline uh, issue, uh, come and go and, and mm -hmm. ebb and That's flow. Right. But at the end of the day, I, I believe very firmly, and I think this is a, a, a bit of an iron law of politics, uh, if the other side of this debate really believed people in Scotland didn't want a referendum, and if they really believed that people in Scotland would vote against independence, they would be the ones clamouring for a, a referendum Maybe they right just now. don't want the disruption. They well, don't want people to go through well, it again. For goodness sake. I mean, disruption? I mean, perish the thought that we would have disruption in people's lives right now. The disruption that people are suffering right now are coming from decisions that have been imposed on Scotland against our will. From Brexit to the kind of decisions that we saw Liz Trust take just a couple of weeks ago, the 
the impact and, and that's, of that on people. Now, that is because, as a country, we don't have control over our and, own and destiny. And that's your issue. view, and you take, make that no, very clearly. But I'd like to talk about what you, can what you do. Can I complete one point on this right briefly, now? Briefly, if you can, because so much to talk about. We are here in Aberdeen mm -hmm. uh, for the last uh, five decades, the oil and gas capital of Europe. But Scotland is now uh, the, one of the, the renewable capitals of uh, Europe. We have massive renewable energy, and yet we are sitting here with people of Scotland facing and, soaring energy And we are going to talk about energy a bit later. And soon, possible so power cuts. And we are going to talk about energy a bit later on. Westminster and, is not working. And we're going to talk about energy a bit later on. But I want to stick about what you what you do. Let's say the Supreme Court doesn't allow mm. you to have this vote. Now you've now said if there isn't a way of having a referendum, you would treat the next general election, the next UK general election, as if it were a referendum on independence. Now to be exactly clear about what you mean there, what you're saying is that if more than half of the population voted for parties who back independence you believe that would give you a mandate to make Scotland an independent country? That's what we would do if the Supreme Court say there is no way for a referendum. Can I say that? That is not my preference. It's not what I want to happen. But that's now your plan but, B. Well, look, we have to have an alternative. If, if democracy is blocked, if the, the route by which uh, it would be right to consider and decide this issue, which is a, a lawful constitutional referendum, is blocked by Westminster mm. because they fear the democratic choice of the people of Scotland, then for me and for the SNP and for people who support independence, the choice is then simple. We put our case to people in an election or we mm. give up on Scottish democracy. And, you know, I want to be very clear today, I will never, ever give up on Scottish democracy. But you used to say that doing anything other than having a legal, legitimate referendum was a unionist trap to use your yeah. words, and a few years ago, actually, at your party conference, people put forward the idea of using a general election, and you said, you said be, no, you said it was a trap. But it, but it should be a last resort. I don't want to be in that position. I want to have a, a lawful referendum. That's, mm -hmm. wh whether you support or oppose independence, and both of those views are valid, I'm very clearly on one side of that debate, but whatever your, your, your view is on independence, the way to decide it is in a democratic, lawful referendum. So we're only talking so not, about the not scenario. Not a general election. Well, because but, a general but, election but wouldn't guarantee you okay, independence, so, would it? But, but the, the thing is here, if a referendum is blocked, completely indefensibly blocked by a Westminster government, then what choice do, do we have? We, we say, well, the, the voice of Scotland doesn't matter, Scottish democracy doesn't matter, or we put our case to the people in but the that general also election. Wouldn't be, but let's wouldn't hope we're not a, in that position. But, but that also wouldn't give you a guarantee of it actually happening. And, I mean, per, perhaps it's the case that actually your this... options... Well, well, perhaps it's the case that your options, in a way, are, are sort of running out of road. You know, you promised a referendum in the 2016 election, it didn't happen. You promised a referendum in 2017, it didn't happen. You tried again in 2019, it didn't happen. It was promised again in 21 and it didn't happen. And now there's this potential plan B, if the court doesn't go your way, about using the next general election. Now, this isn't about saying whether it's a good idea or not a good idea. It's about whether or not you maybe admit that you just don't have the mechanism to make it happen. You just don't well, have do you know, the if method. True, if, if that is true, if my options are, are limited, which, you know, obviously is the case to some extent, then yeah. that is because I am in, Scotland is in a system, and we face a Westminster system that simply will not respect Scottish democracy, that will not look at an, an election result in Scotland, uh, electing a government on a manifesto commitment for a referendum and say, do you know what, we will argue against independence in that referendum, but it is right and proper that we respect the right of the people of Scotland to decide. So if, if our options are limited, it is because a Westminster system refuses Scottish democracy. And I have to say, that then is one of the most powerful arguments mm. for Scotland being an independent country. The UK is meant to be you know, a voluntary partnership uh, of nations. And if we have a position where Scotland is told that we're not even allowed the choice of becoming independent, mm -hmm. then it is no longer a voluntary partnership of nations. The whole basis of the United Kingdom falls apart. So that is a really powerful argument for being an independent country, so that we do then have a partnership of equals with the other nations Well, it's of going the to be UK. a fascinating few weeks yes, and months indeed. ahead with the court decision. Um, let's turn to energy, and we are, after all, in Aberdeen, capital of the UK oil and gas industry. Um, you've criticised the UK's plan to issue new oil and gas licenses 
and you've said they should be climate compatible. There's a system of checking whether or not things um, tick all the right boxes. But would you ever support issuing new oil and gas licenses? I know it's up to Westminster at the moment, but if you're independent, so it'd be up said, to you. Would you approve them or not? Well, I'll come directly to that question in a minute, but let's just put this into context, first of all. The, the North Sea, which has served Scotland well, mm -hmm. is you know, a mature basin. It's a declining resource, uh, even before we consider the environmental uh, imperative here. Yeah, but, but we but also, is a, I'm, I'm is coming a... on to, but we also have the environmental imperative of having to move away from fossil fuels as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. People have and the Scotland is in the lucky. Their bills and keep their lights on. Yeah, but, yeah, but, but exactly. We're in the lucky position of having this vast renewable potential. We've just given the go ahead to up to 28 gigawatts of offshore wind energy and, through and, the Scotland and first auction. For, forgive so me for pressing the... you, but time is short. This is a question of principle. Would you ever? Can you see circumstances where you would approve licences for new oil what and I've gas exploration? Whether it's new licences or existing licences that are applying for development consent, there must be at every stage a robust climate compatibility check. But if there check. is, so you if, would, because Friends of the Earth have said there can be no climate compatible new oil and well, gas. So that, in a sense, is the point I'm coming on to. I am very sceptical as to whether new exploration can pass that test. But without seeing the, the climate compatibility, compatibility assessments, I can't answer that question in the hypothetical. But I am sceptical in the context we are in right now, uh, if, that, if, if any of but that would pass But that's interesting, because clearly then on principle, if they could, then you might, you wouldn't say well, no, we're, no, we're never. We're in a hypothetical situation. Okay. The problem right well, now is it, those climate compatibility yeah. checks are not being done uh -huh. uh, in the, the case of but, but you're clearly like saying no, no, never, but you're, just, you're not sure uh, if they and they're would not be. doing. They're not uh, been done strongly enough in the case of okay. new licences. Okay. Now, income tax is devolved in Scotland, mm. and there's a different tax system, different tax rates. Um, but Liz Truss has just announced a 1p cut to the basic rate, 20p down to 19 Well, she's announced it, whether it actually comes into being. Well, well that's a question for her and the government. You know. We might ask Nadeem Zahawi later on. But will you cut your tax rate to match that so that people pay less in Scotland? Well, we will set our budget in December and we will set out our tax plans as part of that. And we will come to that uh, decision in a, a balanced way, taking account of all of the, mm -hmm. the factors you would expect any government to. But can I, but point, out, can I point out right now, right now, mm -hmm. the majority of income taxpayers in Scotland already pay less income tax than the rest they, of the They do, the but UK. that's why I asked this question, because after the UK's changes, sure. all Scottish taxpayers will pay the same or more if you don't if, match if we, any of the tax cuts. And we'll take that decision in the course of our budget consideration and we will Mind weigh you, up. There's about a million we, people in Scotland who pay 20p. The, the need to ensure uh, that tax is fair and progressive. We already have a more progressive system, but we'll also weigh up the need to have proper investment in our public services, not least our National Health Service, which is having you know, significant challenges right now, what we will not do. Uh, and uh, it's not that long ago, just a week or so ago, when Scottish Conservatives, yeah. commentators, mm -hmm. were demanding that we followed suit to abolish but the in, top rate of tax. We will not cut tax for the wealthiest at the expense but, but of everybody else and their public services. this isn't about that. This is about there are about a million people in Scotland who pay that rate. And what I'm hearing this morning is you, 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 you well, aren't you ready to, to say well, whether but, or not they'll have, pay less. The they'll greatest, have a cut in the same with way the greatest that English respect, Laura, we have cut. a well-established mm -hmm. budget process in Scotland. Oh, no, that's fine. I'll just ask so you the question the and you don't want to answer it yet. And that's we fine. will take the decision based on a balanced consideration. This is a really difficult time for people. Mm -hmm. We are doing things to try to lift the incomes mm -hmm. of those at the lowest. We have a Scottish child that's payment why they might in quite Scotland. Like a tax cut. Oh, but, but we have a Scottish child payment in Scotland that nobody else in the UK has. £25 a week almost uh, soon for every child in low-income families. Uh, we don't pay for prescriptions in in Scotland, we have and, free and, tuition and in lots Scotland. of decisions you have to make in order to your budget. And we'll, so we'll, 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 we'll look in forward Scotland to get good value for money, a better value for money than anywhere well, else in the that's, UK. That's your view. We'll look forward to seeing your budget a bit, fact, later in the, a, a bit later in the year. <laughs> Just briefly, we're, 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 we're running out of time. But um, is, let's trust a friend or a foe. Uh, we, we're political opponents, but I've always tried to work with her predecessors and I will try to work with her. So I would like to be a friend on the basis of. Uh, the areas where we can work together constructively. And what about Keir Starmer, friend or foe? Uh, I work very well with Keir Starmer over Brexit. I'm really disappointed that Keir Starmer um, has thrown in the towel on uh, the European Union and no longer wants to take the UK or Scotland back into the and European Union. who would you Union. rather have as Prime Minister? Well, that's not a difficult question. I mean, if the question to me is would I prefer a Labour government over a Tory government, I, I detest the Tories and everything they stand for. So it's not difficult to answer that question. Uh, so so yes, you want to see Keir Starmer you know, in what I'd say, Two things, two things. Firstly, 
you know, being better than the Tories is not a high bar to cross right now. I think we need to see more of a radical alternative from Labour rather than just a pale imitation. And if you're asking me, do I think either a Westminster Tory government or a Westminster Labour government is good enough for Scotland, then my answer to that question is no. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, thank you thank so you. much for joining us here in Aberdeen this morning. Well, lots to get through from what Nicola Sturgeon has been saying to us. Um, Joanna Cherry, what did you make of what you heard? Does this general election as a referendum kind of stack up to you? Well, I mean, I, I agree with everything the First Minister has said. As I said earlier, it's some time now since I first advocated that we should test the legal case. Um, and uh, as I stressed earlier, <coughs> and as the First Minister stressed, there's a majority in the Scottish Parliament for a second referendum to be held. Even if we lose the Supreme Court case, that wouldn't stop the British government from coming to the negotiating table. And that's what they should do. What makes you think what I'd just, any like, I'd just like they... to say one thing. Um, a lot of people seem to have assumed in advance that we're going to lose. Um, I'm not a party to this litigation, but I've been involved in previous litigations, the prorogation case and the Article 50 revocation case, where everyone assumed we were going so to the lose. Brexit, the big, and we went on Brexit and, and, and we won in, in the Supreme Court and in the European Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. So I would caution people against assuming that we're going to lose the case. I think there's some, there's some very uh, strong arguments. But I'm in agreement with the First Minister that we shouldn't get, she, she doesn't need to flesh out her strategy on how she would use a general election as a, a plebiscite until we see the outcome of the Supreme Court case. But there has to be, there, there has to be a recognition of the mandate that the First Minister got in the last election. There has to be a recognition that the Scottish Parliament, the majority of MSPs in it, want to hold a second referendum. If we cannot do that, then we need some sort of democratic event to demonstrate that the balance of, of opinion in Scotland has uh, changed uh, since uh, 2014. So I I'm with the First Minister on this strategy. I mean, it it's often, it's often, I'm often portrayed as somebody who disagrees with Nicola Sturgeon, but that's not the case. I mean, we have a big disagreement in the area of women's rights and lesbian rights. You know, that's why I lost my seat in the front bench, because I advocated for women's rights and lesbian rights in the face of a very aggressive gender identity ideology. And I'll continue to do that because I think it's the right thing to do. But on the cause and of independence... people would describe that in a, in a different way, John. They may well do, a, but that's what happens. sensitive happened. debate. Now, um, on the cause of independence, Nicola and I are as one. And in fact, many of the issues I've suggested in the party over the years, such as testing this case, supporting <coughs> a people's vote, have gone on okay. and become Alistair party Alistair what did you make of what you heard? I mean, you and Nicola Sturgeon did combat in the uh, independence referendum in 2014. Has she managed to change your mind? Uh, no. The thing that I think is, is striking is that, you know, this, is, this argument, certainly from the SNP perspective, is always characterised by the, giving the impression that somehow everybody in Scotland wants another referendum and it's being blocked by the Conservative Party uh, in uh, Westminster. Now, opinion polls are not everything, but the two polls that you showed, I think, are quite instructive. One is, if you look at what's happened since 2014, really... Scotland is split down the middle. Mm -hmm. This country is tearing itself apart. And that uncertainty is damaging to our growth prospects and to our, our, our well-being. The second thing is, it is abundantly clear there is not an, a majority of people in Scotland who want another referendum any time soon. have a point, though? Because if Scottish voters repeatedly, as they have done, choose the SNP as the most popular party, and the SNP has a clear plan to have independence in this country, doesn't she have a point? that actually they're unfairly stuck. Well, look, I, the, in, in every uh, Scottish election, on general election, uh, I remember being told by the SNP, look, this isn't about independence. We just want to, uh, people to vote for us because, you know, they say they can run the country uh, properly, which is highly debatable, I think. You see, if there really was a surge and support for independence, you would expect to see it reflected in polls. And these polls are conducted just about every week now. Mm -hmm. Certainly but plenty of them. There's, there's no shortage of them. Mm. But what, what, what I think, what worries me is my argument about in 2014 and my argument today is that I think Scotland is stronger. I don't 
we have no truck with the present Tory government. We've got the general election coming up in a couple of years. But the, the idea that Scotland could do everything you want and it will all be lovely uh, with independence is it just isn't true. For example, I understand that the position of the SNP mm. now on currency is they're going to use the pound. This would be the same pound that the Tories have been busy you know, trashing. Well, so well, how is that, that, that going, going to be, be better? A, a policy paper published next week, well, which will flesh out that that position. Will come in the next I'd, like to, I'd, I'd yeah. like to move on, because we, we will have yeah. a bit more, more time at the end. But Martin Pibworth, we asked the First Minister about whether or not you know, she would say no, 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 never to a new oil and gas exploration. It was, I think it was, it was interesting that she wasn't perhaps initially that keen to give us a clear answer, but is it possible that we can have energy security without still having to have oil and gas as backups? Well, what, what the First Minister referenced was vast renewable potential, so that was a pleasing thing to hear. She also talks about the environmental imperative of progressing in terms of these technologies. Um, part of the renewable system, a renewable system, involves some intermittency. So you do need some flexible backup to that intermittency. Part of the solution going forward for that uh, in the longer term will be carbon capture and hydrogen. Hydrogen can be produced from renewables, but carbon capture will need some um, gas to fuel it. And so having some um, energy security that provides some of that gas would seem pretty sensible to, to, to And is me. that going to be the case for quite some time, do you think? Because you know, every politician we ever hear from, and probably everybody <coughs> watching, thinks the push to renewables is a good thing. But sometimes the wind doesn't blow, sometimes the sun doesn't shine. So for how long do you think we'll have to have a backup of oil and gas? Yes, so it's extremely windy today, as you probably noticed this morning <laughs> yeah, in Aberdeen. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, we have a, a wind, a wind farm uh, just just coming on right now at Sea Green, um, just it's off the coast massive, of Angus. Yeah. Huge. Um, we'll be able to, once it's f fully powered, be able to provide uh, energy for 1.5 million homes. These offshore wind farms are getting bigger, their load factors are higher, and therefore their reliability is, is better and their intermittency less so. But you still will need something to replace the gap when wind doesn't and grow. Nuclear comes into that. play now. But you know? there is also su such pressure because of what's happening in Ukraine. And I think you know, we can show people the extraordinary scenes in the last couple of days with the bridge from Russia into, Ukraine, into Crimea um, has had this huge explosion and fire, and that's something that you know, really might be is significant in the course of what's what's going on there but just in terms of the factors that have caused such problems just remind us why is the conflict in ukraine putting such pressure on for everybody so, so i mean russia's been a big provider of gas to europe um, and we import some gas from europe over the winter um, and therefore the reduction in gas supply, the weaponization of gas, creates a, uh, a slight fear premium in markets. Mm -hmm. That's actually been buttressed by other one-off events that mm, I referenced in the introduction. So that all leads to um, a little bit of volatility in the markets, which is almost unprecedented. Um, and part of the reason the UK is in a less exposed situation is because of its long-term policy, which has led to long-term investment in renewables. And one that actually all politicians, I think, of every, of every party agree should be accelerated going forward, not only to do the right thing by the environment, but also to provide energy security for the country. Uh, and the other massive pressure, of course, from energy on the markets that we're seeing is what's happening with interest rates. I mean, there's a big piece in the Telegraph this morning. I think we can show people about the tensions around that. What on earth is going on between the Bank of England and the government? I mean, you know what it's like to be a chancellor in a crisis. What is it like? What does it feel like? Well, it's not great, is the answer to that. Um, <laughs> That's my big dramatic question yes. answer. <laughs> um, look, the, the key thing when you're facing a crisis is, amongst, is to be able to work with others who can help you. And one of the things that worries me about what happened in the last um, couple of weeks or so is it appears to me that the government was not talking to the Bank of England. And it looks like the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee was completely blindsided about an announcement. Do you think they were we, in the dark? I, th I don't think... I, I don't, I, have not spoken to them, but I do not think they knew what the government was going to do. Now, in every budget announcement uh, and every you know, statement that I made, I would always make sure that the governor of the Bank of England knew what we were doing, and we, we met very regularly. Instead, what you've seen is the government, and they're at it again today, trying to trash the Bank of England, along with having excluded the Office of Budget Responsibility. This is undermining... It's the government's credibility that is being un undermined. And the unfortunate side effect so the direct effect of this is because of what's going on just now, interest rates are going to be higher than they would otherwise be. And, of course, that feeds directly into the amount of money pe people pay on their mortgages as well as, as prices generally. So I think the relationship between the government of the day and the Bank of England is absolutely critical. What you can't do is trash it and, or just ignore it. 
because they will pay a heavy price from that. And I don't mind if the government's in trouble. I do mind very much what's happening to our country uh, because, you know, our credibility is being damaged, <laughs> what we're having, going to have to pay in the future because of high prices and so on. That and was it's, hugely damaging to our growth prospects. And it's certainly one of the biggest challenges that this government is trying to grapple with. Now, no surprise, the First Minister was only too keen to mention the chaos that has been seen in the Tory party since Liz Truss took over. In the seven days since we spoke to the Prime Minister in Birmingham, it feels like turmoil has become the new norm. And if there's been a quicker or dramatic, more dramatic fall in support, I'm not sure I can remember it. Not so long ago, Liz Truss was the pick of many of her cabinet allies. One of them was Nadine Dorries, who emerged with this endorsement outside Downing Street, that Liz Truss was the one to continue Boris Johnson's work. The candidate that we select, and uh, for me it's, it's Liz who I'm going to back, will continue with those manifesto promises and will continue to deliver for the government and for the Conservative Party moving forward. But fast forward a few weeks and here we are. Nadine Dorries has been accusing number 10 of lurching to the right, saying the Conservatives have no mandate to do this and suggesting if the Prime Minister wants to proceed, she needs a fresh mandate. Well, Nadine joins us from the Cotswolds this morning. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Um, you were one of Liz Truss's biggest supporters. Why are you so cross with her now? Well, Laura, can I just clarify? I'm still one of Liz's biggest supporters. Um, but you have to uh, put that into the context, the fact that we are 30 points behind Labour in the polls. And if there were a general election tomorrow, that would probably mean complete wipeout for the Conservative Party. And so I think now is the time while we, uh, while we have a new Prime Minister and a new administration to reflect on what's gone wrong and what we need to do to put that right and to reverse that poll deficit. That must be our absolute priority at the moment. And if she doesn't change course, what should happen then? Should she go to the country or should your party try to remove her? Well, well, I believe that it's not so much changing course as perhaps nuancing um, the, the policies and the mandate that she's taking forward in a slightly different way. You know, the, the fact is that just after a leadership election and at the start of a new administration, what we don't need is a disruptor. What we need is a unifier. And I think probably that the new Prime Minister has, has realised that over the last few weeks. And whereas I fully, I am fully on board with an agenda for growth, we also have to be very careful that we don't throw, and I've said this so many times before, the baby out with the bathwater. People voted for Boris Johnson, and it's not Liz Truss's fault that Conservative MPs removed him. And they also voted for a mandate and a manifesto. And, but, you know, we can't throw what they voted for out also because then we've completely disenfranchised the voting public. So I would just ask Liz to consider carefully what it is... But if she doesn't reverse her plans and go back to that 2019 manifesto, what should happen then? Because what you said on social media the other day suggests that you think there could be a general election. She needs a fresh mandate. No, I was actually pointing out a, the simple um, principle of our democracy and our unwritten constitution is that if you're going to have a completely fresh mandate, a completely fresh set of policy ideas and a new prime minister, it would um, be right to go to the country. Liz doesn't need to do that, and I really hope she won't do that when we're 30 points behind in the polls. But what we do need to do is to, to ensure that the policies that are being announced, and I think, you know, that the, the Cabinet letter, which has been written by Cabinet Ministers to MPs today, asking them to unify behind Liz is the right thing to do. But I think also Number 10 need to take a step back and they need to think also about how they unify the party and the policies and how together we do what is right to move forward and to decrease that poll deficit. But I ask you this morning, if she doesn't ditch the policies that you don't like, that people didn't vote for in 2019, what happens then? You know, you and I both know there are people in the Conservative Party discussing whether or not they might need to remove Liz Truss. What should happen if she doesn't reverse? Well, I think those people who are doing that need to stop. We can't have a leadership election, put a new leader in place and immediately to start discussing about how we remove that leader. They need to stop, they need to get behind her and they need to support her. And how they do that is by, um, by 
engaging both with number 10 and number 10 need to start engaging with the parliamentary party i don't believe but that liz is politically suicidal i don't think i don't i'm sorry nadine just answering you really the substance your, your last question but nadine can you really say with a straight face this morning that your colleagues should get behind her when you've gone public in the last few days saying that she's lurched to the right, saying she doesn't have a mandate, saying that she's got to ditch their policies? I mean, some viewers might this morning think that you and others are part of the problem and just wondering why the Conservative Party can't get its act together. So, Laura, the Conservative Party was 30 points behind, actually 38 points behind in the red wall seats before I... Um, even made an utterance. So it's, I think, at the time when the party is failing so badly. Remember, it's five points behind on the day we, they Conservative MPs removed Boris Johnson. I think when the Conservative Party is in such a dangerous position, it is incumbent upon MPs to discuss with Number 10 and with the leader what we think is the, the right way forward. Because we all know our constituencies and we know what our voters voted for. And what I would say is it's time now for Number 10 and for Liz Truss to start sitting down with Conservative MPs and discussing what it is that we need to do to move the party forward to reduce that poll deficit. And I would suggest, you know, one of Liz's policies I completely agree with. You know, we need right now in the country, in the UK right now, 3,000 Spanish telecommunications engineers who are in Spain. We need Suala to say they don't need the English language test to have a short-term, six-month, nine-month visa to come here and help with the gigabit rollout programme. That would get us from 70% gigabit rollout to 95%. That is an agenda for growth. So I think what Liz needs and to Nadine, do is some you, of her policies I, I absolutely agree with. She needs to discuss them with backbench Nadine MPs Doris, and decide a better way forward. an obligation to speak out. Nadine Doris, you clearly feel an obligation to speak out about how bad things are. Um, can you, though, see a situation where Boris Johnson returns as Prime Minister? I know you speak to him often still. Um, so the only message from Boris Johnson to anyone is to support Liz and to back Liz. Um, for that to happen, I mean, there is no process for that to happen. And I think it would take a bizarre reversal of what normally happens. Instead of Graham Brady going to see him with a revolver, I think he'd need to go and see him with an olive branch. And I think it's something Conservative MPs would have to really want. But at the moment, I can tell you, it's not even something Boris Johnson is thinking about. But could it happen? I notice you're not ruling it out. So I don't, I've been in politics a long time. I don't rule anything out. But I would say it is highly, extremely unlikely. OK, Nadine Doris, carefully not quite ruling that out, a return of Boris Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us from the Cotswolds this morning. Now, let's get away from politics for a few minutes. Take a breath. You might know him as Jimmy Perez, the brooding detective with a trademark pea coat, managing somehow not to shiver on Shetland. The actor, Douglas Henschel, spent nearly a decade playing the character in the huge hit drama, developing fans all around the world. But having upset some of them by leaving, he's now back in the theatre with a new play that retells the brutal downfall of Mary, Queen of Scots. We'll be talking to him in just a second. But first of all, we were lucky to have a peek at the rehearsals of the play ahead of its opening night. In the meantime, you stay here, missus. There's no one you'd go and talk to, is there? You can not make me. I, I can. Son, this is going to turn around. The wheel will turn. The wheel always turns. A canny man sees it moving and gets himself onto the half going up while the rest goes down. So you get that gate open, you come and see me in a few weeks. I can't do that. That's... Those are not my orders. Well, you need to start taking your orders from me now. That's what you need to be doing. You can see that, eh? I can see you raising an eyebrow when you're actually watching that. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to the, about the play in, in, in just a second, but most people watching this morning know you from Shetland. Why did you leave? Um, I, I, to be honest, I thought we'd murdered enough people <laughs> um, on, a, on a small island. You know, I think 10 years is a very big chunk of time. I think we'd explored his personal story. I think all the, the ends of those... Um, uh, threads were, were needing to be tied up in some way. Can the programme exist without that character, though? Because they are going on. You've, you've said it's weird for them to be filming it or it feels weird for you. Is it, is it right that it's going on? 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think there's, you know, I'm very happy that it's going on, um, and I hope it does well. You know, it, it means that there's a lot more work for Scottish actors, there's, you know, more work for crew, there's more money coming into the islands, you know, so um, I, I just hope they don't make a mess of it, that's all. But did you think that it should carry on? Because I know you, you obviously feel that, you know, the, the ends were tied up, mm. maybe there had been too many murders, was it the right thing? I think it's certainly the right thing for me mm. to go, um, and and I, I wasn't going to leave. David Kane and I, after series five, sat down and thought, how many more of these can we credibly do? Mm -hmm. And we thought that if we another two seasons, then we could tie it up and, and end it well. But that was to end the whole show. It wasn't just to end Jimmy Perez and for him to walk away. It was that was the show that was going to end. The BBC have decided that they want to resurrect it and and reinvent it to a degree. So it's not going to be the show that I was in. But um, it does give them room to do something different. Which... And more work for Scottish actors. Um, we're sitting here surrounded by Scottish history in this beautiful gallery in Aberdeen. Your, your play is about to open. What made you want to do a play about Mary, Queen of Scots? I mean, she's an extraordinary character from history. But for people who are not familiar with her, what was the appeal? Um, the appeal was Rona's, was, was this particular play because it's not a conventional historical play. It centers around the uh, events that happened at Dunbar Castle. Um, and it's taken a modern sensibility to look back at those events and see it through you know, the prism of consent, really. And it's, it was actually my wife, when she read it, she said, you're doing this. Um, because I think what Rowan has done is pretty groundbreaking. Um, but it is quite, it's quite a brutal play. It is, and when I, when I read it, you know, you see that all these issues between men and women, and it's set, of course, in the 16th century in, something that, in the context of something that really did happen. But from your reading of it what, does it, what does it tell us? Well, it tells us that Mary, Queen of Scots, was raped, I think is the most important thing that it tells us. Um, and I thought, well, you know, why, isn't, why, don't I, why didn't I know about that? And it's basically because a group of men signed a document into law saying she wasn't, in order for um, James the sixth, James the first and sixth, to be able to kind of save face that you know we actually allowed this to happen to our queen. You know, I mean, it would have been you know a huge embarrassment, I imagine they thought. Of. So you know, history says she wasn't. But this play they are absolutely tells a different kind of explodes truth. that, yeah. It's fascinating and it'll be interesting to, to see how people respond to it when they, when they see the play. But, but just, obviously, we've been talking to Nicholas Thurgeon this morning um, about the still, but still a very live conversation in Scotland. You were sympathetic to Scottish independence. Can you see, though, the question being settled now? And I know you moved back from London to live in Scotland again. And there's a line in the play that stuck in my mind when I read it, was that Scotland is a, a nation that lives in argument. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, I think, you know, ar around the, the idea of, you know, John Knox was just coming to the fore at the time that our plays set. So um, I think with regards to, but, uh, although uh, actually, you know, I see the, the line that, you know, we're a nation that lives in argument, but at that particular time, we were actually looking for alliances with France and with England. You know, it was far more um, conducive to, to <coughs> We were going in the reverse direction that, than we are just now, you know. Um, so, but I, I, I don't know. I don't think you can ever settle an entire country as opinion, can you? Uh, <laughs> much as politicians might like to try. Yeah. OK, Douglas Central, thank you so much for joining us this morning thank here you. in Aberdeen. Well, let's get back to those br modern brutal politics. But first, I should tell you that the new play about Mary, Queen of Scots, opens on the 21st of this month at the Hampstead Theatre in London. And, of course, you can still watch as many episodes of Shetland as you like on the BBC iPlayer <laughs> any time of day, day or night. But... Back to that modern, brutal politics, what is going on in the government. Just a couple of minutes ago, we heard Nadine Dorries say that Liz Truss doesn't have any mandate for her new policies, and number 10 should think again. So how can the Conservative Party put itself back together after the last few weeks? Nadine Zahawi is a senior member of the Cabinet, maybe the one with the most obscure title. He's the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. But he's been writing today in the newspapers about unity and the need for Conservatives to get together. And he joins us now from our London studio. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, Nadine Zahawi, Nadine Doris has basically said, let's trust is on borrowed time unless she changes her ways. 
Can you see a situation where the party ousts her? No, I think what the party uh, will do is get behind Liz Truss. Why do I say that? Because, uh, as uh, you've just shown with my article, um, delay is our great enemy. Division will cause delay. Uh, and, of course, ultimately, um, if we don't deliver in the next 24 months on that growth plan, on the energy plan, to make sure we invest in nuclear, and I noticed you didn't ask Nicola Sturgeon about why she's blocking investment in nuclear in Scotland, investing in more offshore and onshore wind, in hydrogen, and, of course, in gas. Really important. Well, uh, we we produce about half of our gas morning, at the moment. Nazim, we're so, asking new questions this morning, Nazim Zahawi. Sure. I mean, is it sensible for the government to be avoiding running a public information campaign telling people to cut back on their energy plans? I mean, that seems to have been a row that's happened in Westminster this week. Why don't you just explain to people how they can cut their costs and cut their bills? You will know that if you go on gov.uk, you will see lots of ways where you can cut the costs of your energy as a business or as a household. Uh, both the National Grid and Ofgem are running a campaign uh, to further sort of explain to people how they can do that. That's a good thing. What we didn't want to do is spend another £14 million of taxpayers' money on a separate campaign. Uh, and so some of this stuff is obviously, you know, you and your colleagues um, uh, uh, describe these things as if it's some sort of a, a, a big divide. That's not true. What we're trying to do is deliver that economic growth plan, which we have, and, of course, the energy plan that will deliver. And we will demonstrate to the nation in 24 months' time why uh, we've, we've done what we've done, how we have performed. We, they can be measured. My role as the chief operating officer, as I call myself, for Liz Truss's government, is to focus on delivery, and delay is our great enemy. That's why I think it's right to pull so together Minister, and focus on, on the plan. But, Minister, I want to stick on this point about this, this energy campaign. So we know that the Business Department prepared an energy campaign to help people cut their bills and to help people cut their energy use. And we think they spent £15 million on it. Why not just roll it out? Why prevent this happening? No, hold on a second, Laura. I think you've got it the, the wrong way around. What the uh, Prime Minister, quite rightly, uh, as... Uh, she has done is to say we don't need to spend 14 or 15 million pounds on another campaign um, if National Grid and Ofgem are doing that work. If you go on .gov UK on our um, uh, platform, you will see how you can actually save uh, energy. That's, I think, being prudent with taxpayers' money. It isn't a, a, a divide. It's basically saying, look, you know, we've got l both National Grid and Ofgem doing work. A lot of the energy providers are also in direct contact with their customers, as they would be in supporting them. Uh, it's right to spend our time and energy and money supporting the 8 million households that are most vulnerable with that £1,200. And now Liz has gone further and, and actually delivered an, a, a, an unprecedented energy intervention to cap energy well, costs for let's, households. Let's the average about, household won't pay more than two and a half thousand pounds. That is, so, yes, that is the, the right Minister thing to do with taxpayers' that money. That's the week, prudent thing to do with taxpayers' money. So let's, let's talk about what might happen this winter. Is the government preparing for the possibility of blackouts? So it is a very unlikely scenario. National Grid put out their report. I chair the meetings on resilience. And we have done a couple of things that actually make us more resilient. One, we've got the same buffer uh, in terms of energy as last year. Two, we have made sure that we continue to invest in our gas. So gas production is up 26 percent uh, this year. We've also got the second largest LNG processing terminal in Europe in the United Kingdom. So I'm confident um, that the resilience is there, that people can enjoy their Christmas um, and feel that their government is behind them, helping them with their energy bills. And also, uh, in, we, we have to make sure that that, that resilience um, is in place. The way you do that is by you know, working on all these things, including, of course, investing in nuclear and renewables. So you are preparing, though, for the possibility of blackouts. We hear that you, in your view, it's unlikely and you're confident that the government has enough resilience to be able to cope. But to be completely clear, you are preparing for the possibility of blackouts. Right, let me be completely clear. It is extremely unlikely. Um, we have the same buffer as we had last year in the energy system. But we have war on our continent. You were just showing pictures earlier of that uh, bridge being hit, uh, the bridge that connects Crimea to Russia. 
Uh, we have war on our continent. We have interconnectors with our neighbours. Um, in the extreme unlikely event of you know, several things having to sort of align in a bad way, uh, that's what National Grid was talking about. I don't believe that will happen. We are making sure that doesn't happen by investing, of course, in our own. We produce about half of our own gas at the moment. We import half. But we've got the second largest terminal. And if you look at what Centrica and other companies have done to secure more gas into the UK, we only take 3% of gas from Russia. We're in that, in that sort of fortunate position compared to some of our neighbours in Europe. So we are, of course, looking at every scenario. You'd expect no less from the chief operating officer of the government, Laura, that, to look at every scenario. But it is extremely unlikely because of the measures we've taken. OK, and you've made that very clear. Um, one other thing that I think some of our viewers are perhaps starting to worry about a little this morning is what is happening with COVID. Now, the latest ONS stats suggest that one in 50 people have COVID. And Susan Hopkins, a very senior doctor from the UK Health Security Agency, has advised people to be careful about visiting elderly or vulnerable relatives. Is that the government's advice now too? Well, we have to be careful. You remember I was the vaccine deployment uh, minister, and, and um, I'll be getting my, my booster, I hope, in the uh, coming weeks as well as I'm over 55. Um, and of course, everybody who's eligible should go and get their, their booster jab. The NHS um, has plans to be able to cope with both COVID and, of course, winter flu as well. Uh, and of course, as I talked about earlier, you know, the, the focus on delivery, the ABCD uh, that uh, Therese Coffey talks about, thing, ambulances so and of course, backlog. But, but Minister, Susan Hopkins has been quite specifically, she said to the public people should be careful again now because of the risk of COVID and avoid visiting vulnerable relatives or elderly people. Do you agree? Should the public start changing their behaviour? Well, number one, if you have elderly relatives or vulnerable people, get them boosted. Uh, two, be sensible. Get yourself boosted if you're eligible as quickly as possible. With the, we've, got, we've bought the Moderna, which, which protects you against both... Uh, COVID and flu, which is a good thing. So get that boost in place. But be sensible about these things, Laura. That's the message. Just very quickly, uh, Nadine Doris didn't rule out a re return of Boris Johnson. You were a close ally of his as well. Can you see that happening one day? No, I can't. I think um, uh, the uh, previous prime minister is uh, rightly... Um, uh, telling anyone who's willing to listen. And he's a friend of mine, and I work closely with him, both as in vaccines, of course, as Secretary of Education and Chancellor of the Exchequer for him, um, telling all colleagues, get behind Liz, because division will cause delay. Delay is our enemy and ultimately defeat uh, to Keir Starmer. We don't want to see Keir Starmer with Nicola Sturgeon, who, who, who now talks about detesting the Conservatives. I think that language is really uh, dangerous. I prefer to work with my colleagues in Scotland on delivering the free ports, the green ports, okay, as I Zahawi, want to do with I'm John afraid Swinney you say delay and is your enemy. I'm afraid the clock is our enemy on our programme and we are rapidly running out of time. But thank you so much for joining us from London this morning. A brief word finally with the panel. Now, Martin, I know that by nature you've told me that you are an optimist. Um, from what you've heard this morning, do you feel more or less optimistic? Um, I, I am an optimist. Um, the reason the UK has a resilient energy system is because of past investments into renewables. We have the opportunity to expand further in those natural resources. And indeed, we have technological expertise in technologies like carbon capture and hydrogen, which can all be deployed to help us build out of this energy crisis. OK, Joe Cherry, what do you think? More cheerful or less... More cheerful or less? Or less so. <laughs> well, I'm cheerful about the prospects for Scotland. The underlying trend is very much in favour of independence. And I would just ask your English viewers this. In 2015, they voted for David Cameron and they wanted a referendum on whether or not to leave the European Union. Imagine how they would have felt mm -hmm. if the European Union had said you can't have your referendum. They would have been justifiably very annoyed. Okay, well, they're, 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 many people felt for a long time parliamentarians didn't want to end. give them what they voted for. But that's a whole other hornet's nest. Let's not get into that right now. Very briefly, finally, to you, Alistair Darling. Reasons to be cheerful. You started the programme feeling pretty gloomy about what's going on very quickly. Well, I've not cheered up in the last hour, if that's, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> so, I am worried about the prospects of this country. Mm -hmm. I worry about Scotland, mm -hmm. because I think if you have a, another referendum, you're going to have the divisions, you're going to have 
uncertainty, you're going to have insecurity, which is damaging not just the country as a whole, but to us as individuals. And you've got the same thing, you know, from my point of view, you've got two governments, north and south of the border, and frankly, I'm very depressed at the, the picture they're painting. OK, well, thank you all very much for joining us. I'm sorry to end with a depressing message, but fascinating insights Someone from all three it. of you this morning. <laughs> um, that is it for this morning. At the end of this year's party conference season, Glastonbury for weirdos, as one insider described it. I probably include myself as one of them, so I'm not being too critical. What has changed in the last few weeks? Well, the SNP is still locked in the will they, won't they be able to have another vote on independence? The First Minister told us she'll never stop making the case, as she put it, to give up on Scottish democracy. But to use that line from Douglas Henschel's new play, Scotland is right now a nation that lives in argument, and that was from the 16th century. Labour, on the other hand, is straining to look like an alternative government, while the Conservatives are right now, there's no other way of saying it really, in disarray. But more importantly than any of that, of course, many of the public worry about making ends meet and about what this winter really has in store. So plenty for our politicians to get on with when they get back to Parliament in Westminster next week. As ever, if you want to catch up from anything today, you can go to the iPlayer. But that is all for now from Aberdeen. See you next week. Goodbye.